Hey, we just want to welcome you, all of our online campuses down in North Judson, down at our East Campus. Hey, it is awesome, our Westfield Campus. It is incredible that you are here, and I'm glad that you've joined us. And uh, hey, looking forward to this season and to the fall as we're moving in. Last week and a couple weeks ago, we started having the conversation around the thought of just finishing strong. And how many understands that anybody can overcome a bad start, but you cannot overcome a bad finish, right? If, if you finish bad, you lose. So we've been having a conversation around what Paul says in 2 Timothy 4 and 7. He said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. So we've been talking about how Apostle Paul looked at his life. He's sitting in a jail. He's about to be executed for his testimony for Jesus Christ. And Paul is looking back over his life and he said, Guys, I want you to know I fought, I have, I have finished, and I've kept the faith. And one of the, one of the illustrations that I've used in the last few weeks is one that I just cannot get over. I, I just cannot navigate through it without understanding that when you, when you look at a marathon, and how many understands that the Christian race is a marathon? It's not a sprint, right? It's not even a relay race, okay? There's legacies and there's generations that we can pass off. But how many understands that everybody in this room and those what everybody has to run your own race, right? Come on. I, I can't run your race for you. You can't run the race for me. But when you look at the marathon, when you look at an actual marathon, 26.2 miles, studies show that the fewest number of runners will quit a marathon at the first mile you know they start and the fewest numbers will start and they will quit the second fewest numbers of runners will quit at the last mile you know right right at the very end they stop but here's here's the staggered statistic the most people will quit a marathon in the 20th mile now this is just staggering You've already run 20 miles. You only like 6.2 miles to finish, and yet you quit. Now, what, what, I, what, I, what I get out of that illustration is the simply fact that we see it in our culture today. You and I in America are living in one of the most blessed countries and nations there is. Uh, America is a great nation. Come on, can I get a witness on that? We are blessed. We are living in one of the most wealthiest times any generation has ever lived in. And in the midst of all of the prosperity that this world is seeing and the church is experiencing, because let me tell you, the church is doing pretty good in America. And yet in the midst of that, we're seeing more and more people, they get so close to finishing and they stop. Now some of you in this audience this morning, some of you could... could uh, boast about the fact, well, you know, Pastor Phil, I've been a believer and I've followed Jesus most of my life. And that's incredible. I, I love that testimony. Rhonda and I grew up in church and, and, you know, she got saved when she was six. I started getting saved when I was about six, but I kept getting saved, you know, for the next 10 years or so. Okay, come on. Some of you can relate to that, right? I, I had to get saved every week. I, was a, I needed a lot of prayer, I'm telling you. Thank God I didn't give up, okay? There's some of you here this morning, you, you can boast about, I've been in church all my life, I've followed Christ, and that's amazing. What, I, what, I, what I'm concerned for you and I that have done this, that we get so close to the end of the way that we lose our focus and we stop. There's others of you that you've just started this race. Some of you are even here today, and you, you maybe have never really made a full commitment to Christ yet, and yet you're, you're thinking, well, how is this thing going to be? What is it going to look like? How are we going to navigate through the culture and life? And, and, and so what I want to speak to you today is it just isn't about starting well. It's how do we finish well. 
and to make sure that you and I don't feel like that we're somehow or another this odd culture. I've shared with you another statistic that's just mind-blowing that over two-thirds of the leaders in the Bible, over two-thirds of the leaders that God gives us their name, He gives us their story, over two-thirds of the Bible did, uh, of the leaders in the Bible did not finish well. That's staggering to me to think that these are men and women that God called. I talked to you a little bit last week about Joash in First Chronicles, and we had the story of Joash. He started reigning when he was seven, and he started so well. He served God. He followed God. But in the process, when the priest, when the influencer in his life died, then Joash's heart got turned away from God. He backslid, and Joash dies at the age of 47, having not finish well and every time I read Chronicles or Kings and I I read the stories I'm reading through the Bible I kind of often dread the inevitable assessment of what that king's life is going to be or was they faithful were they disobedient I think about another king. I'm not going to preach about Asa this morning, but when you read Asa's story in 1 Kings chapter 15, the Bible said he ruled Judea for 41 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just like his, his father David had done. Asa was successful. He reigned. He honored God. The Bible said that the Lord would fight his battles, would defeat his enemies. He took down foreign altars. He broke down the pillars and cut them up. That that was a false idols. Matter of fact, in one place you read about Asa, he was so bold in following God, he actually removes his grandmother from, from her place in the kingdom because she was following other God. Now that's pretty bold when you take on grandmama. Come on. I mean, you you got to have Jesus in your life if you're going to go bothering Grandma. But he did. But the sad thing about Asa is that he was a good king almost to the end. But the Bible said in the 36th year of his reign, now which he was almost 90% finished with his race. In the 36th year, he stopped relying upon God. He had an enemy coming against him, uh, against uh, uh, where he was leading, and he went to the Syrian, uh, to, to, to the Syrian army. And the Bible said that he emptied out the treasure of, 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 of the temple. He took all the national treasure, and he went to, to Syria, and he offered them a bribe. In other words, he tried to pay somebody to fight his battles for him. And when God saw what Asa did, it displeased him. The Bible said that Asa took sick. And instead of him turning to God for help in the midst of his sickness, he started looking to other physicians. And in the process, for 36 years, Asa was serving God, following God. In the last five years, he lost it. Five years from finishing, and he stopped. Now, that's staggering to me. And again, what what I want to put inside you and my life and this conversation that we're having is the importance of not just starting the race, but how do we finish real strong? Some of you that's got husbands and wives, some of you that's got children or grandchildren, they're looking to you. They need you to model for them perseverance. They need you to model for them a consistency that you're pressing on in spite of the difficulties in your life. It, it, it saddens my heart today when you hear of people that get so close to the end and then they don't finish very well. Sad me when I hear of Christian leaders like we hear uh, of Christian leaders today that they live long, uh, they, they appear to have long faithful ministries, they, they, they stand against the falsehoods, they endure trials and persecution, but it seems that they lose their focus at the very end and they walk away from the ministry. That, that's heartbreaking to me. So how can we navigate through that so that we can finish strong? How many, how many wants to finish strong? Come on, is that your heart desire? You want to hear the words, well done, from Jesus instead of just him looking at you and saying, well? 
Paul said, I've finished, I've fought, and I've kept the faith. Would you just bow your heads? Thank you, Austin. Father, I thank you this morning. God, for the conversation of your word, I ask you right now just to open our hearts to what you want to speak to us and how you want to navigate for us individually, collectively as a church, how that we can make sure that we are finishing strong. And everybody said amen to that. So we're having this conversation around how do we finish strong? How do we, how do we live a life in such a way as Paul said, I fought, I finished, and I kept the faith. You know, some of you, if you've been around the church very long, you, you hear the statistic that says that some 1,500 pastors every month will leave the ministry. Now, that's just mind-blowing. The good news is it isn't 1,500 pastors that quit. The good news is about 250 pastors leave the ministry every, every month. That's about 3,000 a year that will walk away for whatever reason. Sometimes it's moral failure. Sometimes they change careers. They go in different paths. But the number that I often use is still very true, that only one out of ten will ever finish and ever get to the place of retirement. One out of ten ministers who accept the calling of God, who says, God's called me in the ministry, God's called me to work for him in their labor for only one out of ten. Listen, folks, that's ten percent of men of God who start, but they never finish. Now, I'll give you these statistics because, listen, I don't think there's that much difference between me and you. You see, we often say that pastors are paid to be good. You all are good for nothing, okay? I mean, just, just you do understand what I mean by that, right? I mean, you pay us, guys. We get paid to read our Bibles, to pray, to go to church, to do minute. We get paid. You guys, you guys do it for free, okay? You do it for nothing. You're... Good for nothing. So just, just to make sure you understand that, that, that illustration. But listen, here's, here's what I, I really believe. When you talk about Paul, when you talk about Peter, when you talk about in the apostles, when you talk about the first century church, or you talk about the 21st century church, every one of us in this room knows what it is to be able to say there's something that knocked me off my race. There's something that nudged me going the wrong way. Matter of fact, LifeWay research came out back in 2016 of why pastors are leaving the ministry before retirement. And what they revealed to us is not, not all pastors are quitters, okay? Not all pastors are wimps. Understand that, okay? Not every pastor is a quitter. Not every pastor is a wimp. Not every person who goes to church are quitters. But there are people that along the way, they start very well, but something happens and they lose out. See if you can relate to any of these feelings that these pastors say that they have, the reason why they quit. Here's what the Lifeway research reveals. 60% of pastors who leave the pastorate reported feelings of isolation. In other words, pastors who walk away, they said that there was times in my life I felt like I had nobody. I felt like I'm alone. I felt isolated. Now, let me tell you this very true fact here. If you are a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, you have to understand you can't do this journey by yourself. There is no person that is spiritually able, spiritually mature to be able to navigate from earth all the way to heaven. Listen, Christianity is not a lone ranger mentality. And yet we have pastors in our culture today who say they feel isolated. Can I tell you why some pastors feel isolated? Because they are isolated. We have a culture where there are some pastors who they don't even show up to worship until it's their time to hit the stage. They walk in, they come out, you know, they have their place, and then they show up. Listen, you know why I, I, I love hanging out with people? I love work, but I want you to see me worshiping and run to work because I want you to know this is important to us. It, the service just doesn't start when I get the mic in my hand. And you understand that? And there are so many people that will isolate themselves. And I submit to you that there are people within the church that many, many times they feel isolated. Why? Because they are isolated. 
If you don't have a small group, if you're not connecting and serving somewhere, if you're not using your gifts, your talents, your abilities, if you're not coming along other people, encouraging them and letting them encourage you, guess what? You're going to feel isolated. Hello. 60% leave the ministry because of it. Here's another set, 48% of the pastors leave because they feel they wasn't adequately described the context they were stepping into. Nobody told me it was going to be like this, right? And listen, again, I submit to you. Can I tell you that's the way a lot of Christians come into the church? Because, again, there is this greasy grace mentality that all you need to do is come to Jesus. And when you come to Jesus, he'll fix your marriage, he'll fix your life, he'll fix your kids, he'll do everything. Your life will be all, you know, roses. And can I tell you the reality is you can love Jesus, you can go to church, you can pray, you can worship, and your kids still act like they're demon-possessed. The reality is sometimes, some, this reason why we work hard at this church of trying to preach the full gospel of the church. Yes, your life's going to be better when you're following Jesus. Yes, your life is ultimately going to get rewarded for the fact. But it doesn't mean all of your life's problems are going to go away. If you've got a crazy husband now before you're saved, chances are you're going to have a crazy husband after you get saved. That just prayerfully and hopefully prayer will change that craziness as he commits or she commits. Or, well, I'm saying too much. I know. But just nobody told me it's going to. Here's another one that Lifeway said 48% of the pastors who leave the pastor did not feel prepared for the people side. I just love, I didn't tell me I had to deal with people. Oh. I'm going to be in the ministry. Oh, guess what? you got to deal with it. Listen, if you're a shepherd, you've got to deal with sheep. Guess what sheep do? Sheep stink and sheep bite. I'm preaching pretty good right now. You know what pastors say? They prepared me theology. They prepared me, they prepared me the, uh, for, for the theology side. They prepared me for the doctoral side. They didn't prepare me for the people side. They didn't tell me that people would hurt me. They didn't tell me there was going to be conflict in the body of Christ. And guess what there is? 48% of the pastors leave because they said, I wasn't prepared for this. Can I tell you, I submit to you, the reason a lot of people walk away from the church, it isn't because God has hurt you. It isn't because God has did something directly to you. Chances are people walk away when they've had conflict with another person. True? I got lied to. They disappointed me. They wasn't there. La, la, la. Whatever the situation is. And because of that, I'm walking out of the church. I'll never be back again. And it hurts. Listen, I discovered years ago, there's a difference between me teaching principles and me teaching people. Principles has to do with the content. What's in the Bible? What's the word? Being able to teach people, you have to focus not just on the content. You have to focus on the connection. And so, I, listen, I submit to you, it's a whole lot easier for me holding convictions about what the Bible says about something and then trying to lead a group of people to hold those same convictions. Are you with me? It's a whole lot easier for me to have this conviction and say, well, you know, God's word says it, and that settles it, and I'm going to follow it. But listen, when I pastor, I have to lead people and help them develop those same kind of conviction. And and what statistics says, 48% of the pastors walk away and said, hey, listen, I wasn't prepared for this conflict we're going to have in the church. And it's sad to me because it happens within the land. So some of you can relate to that. Some of you have got friends. Some of you have got family. Some of you have got people in your life today that is not in church. And it can be traced back, not because the Bible wasn't true. It can be traced back, not because God wasn't real. It's traced back because somebody within the church did something to hurt them. And can I get a witness? 49% of the pastors just feel overwhelmed. They just say this job, this responsibility, there's just too much demand. And I can relate to that, but most of you can relate to that. Well, you know, Pastor, what do you mean i got to come to church every Sunday? What do you mean I should be given 10% of my time? What do you mean I should be using my gifts in ministry? What do you mean I should be volunteering? What do you mean? What do you mean? You ever felt overwhelmed sometimes? Listen, sure. 
So again, I'm submitting you. This is not a pastoral thing. It's a human being thing. And lastly, 72% of the pastors who leave reported frequent concerns about financial situations. Now, to me, that's perhaps the saddest data point of all, simply because that's very solvable if churches would just take care of their pastors. True? Small churches, larger water. Now, listen, I, I submit to you, this church takes very good care of us. We take care of our pastors. We, none of our pastors have to go lacking. Because, but, but can I tell you, there are, there are hundreds, even thousands of churches out there that they think it's somehow or another God's will for them to make sure that God keeps them humble and they'll keep them broke. You know, it's just God's will for that to happen. Don't give him too much. I never forget when Rod and I started pastoring the church. I was so fearful. We had this, we had this van that, that got like eight miles a gallon because we pulled our 30-foot travel trailer with it. It was a cargo van. We had a love seat in the back. That's where Sunshine slept when we traveled. And uh, you know, and we're we're now pastoring, and I've got to travel, I go to hospitals, I, and I'm I mean, I just gas money, and I traded it, and and, and this guy traded for me for a 72 uh, a Ford L. LTD. I mean, it was a crown victory. I mean, it's a nice car. I, I remember it. I, I hit it for two or three days because I was so afraid people would think I'm getting uppity. Are you with me? Now, I know I look back and that was so stupid and foolish, but it was a culture that I grew up in because I grew up in a time where people think the preacher shouldn't have anything. If you got holes in your shoes, man, you're holy. No, my shoes are wore out. Well... But I submit to you, many people in our church has concerns about financial issues. Some of you that come out of the world and you've never put God first, you've never been taught about stewardship and tithing, it's, it's totally strange when, 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 when you show up and, and you start hearing, hey, we're taking offerings and tithes, and oh, by the way, you need to give God and, and honor God, and, and you think it's about money, and it's never about money, it's about trust. But I can understand of how you, you, you have trouble navigating that, and, and because of that, you hear people say, oh, well, all the church wants is your money. You ever heard people? Well, all the church is. No, no, they don't. The real church, Heartland, has never been about getting something from us. It's always about how do we get something to us. But again, when I read those statistics, according to Lifeway Research, if you want to feel isolated, if you want to be misled, if you want to feel ill-prepared, if you want to be overwhelmed, if you want to be financial stable, guess what? Just get in the ministry, <laughs> and that, you're going to have that lifestyle. But what's this? I tell you those statistics and I give you that story to let you know, isn't it, isn't it true that the enemy loves to target the leaders first? If he can get the leaders derailed, if he can get leaders falling and failing and stop running in the race, is he going to be more successful getting the people that is following the leaders? Absolutely. It's the reason why that I, I'm constantly sharing with our pastors that we have on staff. You put your family first. You pray for your family. You, you make sure that their needs are there. I understand. Listen, the enemy would love for my marriage to fail. He would love for another pastor to get caught. Why? Because, listen, if somehow or another the enemy can put the spotlight there, guess what? He gives other people reasons. And, well, hey, if they couldn't do it, well, I, I guess I don't even try. No, no, no. No, God, God says it doesn't have to be that way. So again, no, no person that I've ever talked to has ever regretted fi finishing strong in a race, but I've, I've talked to many people who regretted finishing very weak or not finishing at all. So, so what I want to navigate you through this morning for the next few minutes and we have this conversation around, I want to take you to 1 Peter. We, we spent some time in the Old Testament last week. Jump over to the New Testament. 1 Peter and 2 Peter, amazing books in the Bible. That, that, that God gives us in the Word. It tells us about the situation that the first century people were facing. Listen, you, you think you have a bad day? They had a bad decade. Okay? They were constantly being pressured. Here's what 2 Peter writes. He said, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who's called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great 
and precious promises so that through them you might participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. The corruption in the world called by evil desires. Desires are evil when you take a legitimate need in your life and you try to meet it a illegitimate way. That's how that's when desires become evil. You understand that? He said, escape the corruption world caused by evil desire. For this very reason, make every effort, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control, perseverance. I'm doing better with that word this week for some of you who corrected me so many times the other way. Perseverance and to perseverance. God. See, I can take it. Come on. Listen, Peter says about halfway through here now, he's given us these things we have to add to our life. And Peter says, listen, I want, don't quit. I, I want you to persevere. I want you. And he says in verse 7, to goodness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities, all the qualities that he's just mentioned, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we want. Every one of us wants to be effective and productive. True? Peter said, you have to add these things to your life. If, any of you, if anyone does not have these things, the things that he just mentioned, goodness, perseverance, he said he is nearsighted, blind, has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. So what's this? Peter is writing to this first century Christian. I mean, and again, they got, they got a cartload of reasons why they ought to be quitting. And, 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 and some of their badness that they're having in their life, as you read through the book, some of their badness is just normal stuff, okay? It's life, it's sickness, it's, you know, it's setback. How many understand? We live in a broken world, right? Nothing in this world is going to work right. People are still going to get sick and they're going to die. Marriages are still going to happen and they're still going to be divorced. Why? We live in a broken world. You can't take two broken people and put them together thinking they're going to have a perfect hereafter. So some of the stuff that they're dealing with and we deal with is just to the brokenness of the world. But which is a lot of the bad stuff that they were dealing with, it had to deal with the fact that they were believers, they were followers, they were Christian, and they would not recant. They would not stop following. Listen, they would not quit. In fact, if you read First and Second Peter, some 17 times alone he mentions about suffering. All kinds of suffering. I don't have time to. He, he said they live like refuse and strangers in the world. He said they suffered all kinds of trials in 1 Peter 1 and 6. 1 Peter 2 and 12, they were falsely accused. They were blamed for things that they didn't do. They, they were subject to brutal uh, working conditions. They were punished for doing good. They were abused and assaulted when, 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 they, when they wouldn't join others' sin. You, you read through there, sometimes they suffered because they wouldn't participate in what they knew were evil evil they were mocked by their neighbors i mean on and on again they were disappointed many many times but listen the truth is all of this suffering would would vanish every bit of that suffering would would leave them if they would have done one thing quit if they would have renounced Jesus, if they would have said, no, 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 I didn't sign up for this, no, there's just simply no way am I going to. If they would have just stopped talking about Jesus, if they would have stopped sharing Jesus, if they would have walked away and said, you know what, we're going to be secret service Christian. We're going we're to have Jesus in our heart, but nobody out in the world is going to. But they refuse to do that. You mean? Some people want to do that, right? I want to be a Jesus secret service person. Yeah, Jesus, I love you. Nobody hears me, though. Nobody knows it. If these people would have just walked away, their life would have been simple. Now, the reason they wouldn't quit is they wouldn't have won the prize. Are you with me? The reason why they wouldn't quit is that they knew that there was something that God was leading them to. So watch this real quickly. Three reasons why we can't quit. Number one, you can't quit... Because, listen, even when in tough times, because following Jesus is the only way to get where and want 
to get where and what we need and where we need to go. Jesus is the only way. Jesus said, I'm the way, guys. I'm the truth. You know what you need. You know where you want to go. The way to get there is you have to follow me. Listen, I remember years ago a guy telling me, he said, Phil, if what you're living for is not worth dying for, it's not worth living for. You meet people all the time who've leaned their ladder and they're climbing the ladder of success only to get to the top of the ladder and realize what? It's leaning against the wrong wall. What do I have? Everything that means anything to me has now been left behind. My family, my relationships, my health. And listen, Peter understood, these early believers understood that Jesus was the way, the way to get where you want to go and to get what you need in your life. And you have to understand that staying persistent, staying consistent, keeping your eyes upon him. The point is, the goal is to reach beyond what the moment. There's something laid up in store for us. How do you get there? Follow Jesus. He says in 1 Peter 10 and 11, he said there's a glory that's going to follow one day. You understand there's, there's more to life than this, what we see. Aren't you glad for that? He says in, in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 11 and 13, he said we have to look forward to heaven, to look forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Can you imagine? Can you imagine living in a neighborhood that's perfect? Can you imagine? Anybody live in a perfect neighborhood? Now, you probably live in a good neighborhood. You, you, maybe you like most of your neighbors. Can anybody here, don't raise your hand, can anybody honestly say you like everybody who lives in your neighborhood? Everybody in my neighborhood. Man, we're just, we're tight. We're bros. We're friends. Oh, no. I guarantee every one of us has got some knucklehead neighbors. Some people that we don't want to spend eternity with at this point. Come on. But you do understand that when eternity happens, every one of our neighbors that have accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior and that get into this new heaven and new earth, there is just going to be righteousness that's going to be dwelling there. He says in verse uh, chapter 5 and verse 1, he said you're going to receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior. Can you imagine a welcome you're going to get because you've been faithful to follow Jesus? You ever see some of the well, uh, see some of the homecomings that they have and people who's been away and they welcome them. You know, they're standing in line and they're cheering and they got the sight. Can you imagine what kind of welcome God's going to have for His people when we have stayed faithful and we refused to quit and we didn't give up and we didn't get just? Can you imagine the welcome that's going to be in heaven one day? It's going to be amazing, folks. Some of you can't imagine it. I can see it right now. Yeah, I don't know what it's going to be like. I just, I just get so excited. I talked to my mom the other day, and we'll see her around Thanksgiving. You know what she's already thinking? Thanksgiving is Christmas for us and my family, and she's already she's making cake. She always makes me a Japanese fruit cake every year for Christmas. It's incredible. And what I love about it, nobody else in my family likes it but my older brother. But he's got some health issues going on, so he only can take a slice with him. She gives me the rest. When I'm talking to her this week, and she's talking about Japanese fruitcake and her, the cakes that she made. Man, I'm just, I'm just drooling. Rhonda's having to take the Kleenex and just wipe. She said, Phil, stop drooling. Stop. I hear you, Mama, talking about them cakes. It's a welcome. She does this. She said, I love it. I love to prepare for the kids to come home and us all get together. Folks, that's going to be amazing when we stand before God one day. But look what Jesus said in Matthew 7 and 13. He said, Wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. You understand that this path of finishing, this race of finishing, it narrows down as we get closer to the end. You understand that? Now, heights don't bother me, but I hate, I hate, I, I hate, I hate tight places. But you understand, Jesus said, the road that you and I are on is narrow. And you bump into people on this road because why? Everybody's going down this path over here, but guess what? Jesus said it leads to destruction. 
If you want what you want and you want to go where you want to go and where you need in your life, he said, I want you to understand it's going to be a narrow path. Matter of fact, when he's speaking in John chapter 6 and Jesus has been telling them, hey, guys, you've got to internalize me. You've got to eat my flesh. You've got to be able to internalize me in your life. He Look at verse 66. He said, from that time on, many of his disciples turned back no longer to follow him. Jesus' own disciples left him. They walked away from him. Why? They said, this is too hard, Jesus. We don't want to hear this. He looked at the rest of his disciples. Look at it. And Jesus turned to the 12 and he said, do you want to leave me too? Are you quitting? And Peter speaks up. He said, Lord... To whom shall we go? You have the words to eternal life. We believe and know that you're the only one from God. Jesus, you're the only way home. Folks, listen, some of you have to get the conviction in your life. If you're going to finish, Jesus is the only way home. He's not a way. He's not one of the ways. He's the way to get home. And you've got to understand there's all kinds of things that's going to try to derail you. But you've got to keep your focus on Jesus. Because he's the only way to get where you want to go and get what you need in your life to get there. Here's the second thing. Write this down. Persevering through suffering is the path to spiritual growth and maturity. I hate this part of the Bible. Now, I, let me back up. I don't like it. I should say my hate for the devil. I hate the devil. I don't like this part of the Bible. Because in the scripture, the Bible teaches us that often hanging in there becomes a perfect tool that God uses to shape our life to be more Christ-like. Now, if, if there was a group of militant soldiers that come in here this morning with masks and, and machetes and machine guns, and, and they lined us all up the wall, and they said, either recant Jesus, either deny Jesus, or you're going to die, most of us could look at each other and say, this is a trial. This is a task. Come on, right? You would recognize it. But do you understand most of our suffering and most of our difficulty don't show up as militant soldiers? Most of our suffering that leads us to growth and maturity disguises itself. It shows up as trials, emotional, physical trials, mental circumstances, trials that start coming in all kinds of different degrees, shapes and sizes. Most of the trials that God is using to shape your life and to grow your life and to grow the maturity are not recognizable. They don't show up in real vivid. You have to understand, wait a minute, God may be doing something here. Peter and James both talked about that, that there's this, this, uh, this character building stuff that's happening in our life. When, when James 1 and 4, he said, Perseverance must finish this work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Have you ever felt like, you know, Isaiah the prophet, he says, you know, behold, the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you am I. Have you ever felt like that you're, you know, you're on the table and, and you're the potter, uh, the, the clay, and God's a potter, potter and, uh, and have you ever felt like that God's molding you and, and, and making you, but in the process you're feeling pressure? Anybody, anybody besides me haven't always loved the trials that God will allow you to go through. Now, some of you, you know, oh, I just, I just appreciate God, everything. I just, I just recognize God's hand. And I'm just telling you, I'm not there. There's, there's trials and there's pressures and there's difficulties that I've had in my life that I absolutely did not want to believe at first it was from God. I just wanted to believe this is just an obstacle. This is just the devil trying to stop me. This is just the devil trying to, and I'm going to punch my way through this. But in the process, God had to slow me down and say, wait a minute. I'm teaching. Are you with me? Paul said it like this in Romans 5 and 4. He said, we rejoice in our sufferings. We will what? We do what? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold the phone, Paul. We don't rejoice in our sufferings. We moan and we groan with our suffering. Woe is me. But he said, we rejoice in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance, character, and hope in our life. God's doing something in my life. 
I'm running this race. I want to finish strong. I've got my focus upon Jesus. I know he's the way, but in the process, what does he do? He puts me through times of suffering. Matter of fact, if you read again through 1 Peter, he said suffering refines our faith. It, protect, it, it, it perfects our hope. It deepens our intimacy. It, 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 it trains us in holiness. And, and it keeps us, back to verse 8 in our text, it keeps us from being ineffective and unproductive. Isn't that what we all want? Don't, we, don't you want your life to count for something? Don't you want your life to be per- I want my children to look at my life and hear my testimony and say, wow, Dad, everything you went through, the struggles, the pressure that you and Mom navigated through for 44 years, you've left us a great testimony. It has been affected on my life. It makes me a better husband. It makes me a better wife. It enables me to raise my children. Why? Because you've been effective. Some of you don't understand the importance of you winning the battle right now. It's just not for you. It's for your kids. It's for your grandkids. It's the reason why the enemy would smile. He'd love it if you just give up and walk away. You go into a hospital room today, and you, 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 you go into places, and you hear people make phrases like, you know, you, you hear conversations in the waiting room. Don't worry, it's all going to work out. Or don't worry, every cloud has a silver lining. Don't worry, tomorrow's a better day. What, what, are, what are all those conversations about? They're about trying to give somebody hope. But you know the real true reality the truth is Romans 8 and 28, all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord to them who are called. To, do you understand that Romans 8 and 28 is not an all-inclusive verse? Listen, if you're not following Jesus, if you're not in the race, there are sometimes you go through stuff that has absolutely no sense and it may never make any sense. It's only when you and I come and surrender our life to Jesus Christ and submit to his lordship that we understand now everything in our life is father filtered. And God said, I'm moving you to a place of growth and maturity. I look back over my life and some of my greatest times of growth and maturity has come when I was hurting and suffering the most. When, when, when I was seeing stress, God was seeing an opportunity. When I was seeing a crisis in my life, God was seeing a way for me to grow and to get better and not to get better. I look back and the times I told you last week, there's been two distinct times in my life that I had opportunity. I thought very seriously about walking away and quitting, but thank God I didn't. Why? Because I understood that persevering through suffering was producing growth and maturity in my life. And some of you right now, you're walking through stuff, you're going through stuff, and there's no rhyme or reason for this. Why? Listen, you have to settle to say, wait a minute, there's a prize, there, there's a race to finish, I, I have to pursue, I've got to keep going. I don't understand it, I don't see it, but I've got to trust that God is filtering this thing, and ultimately, I'm going to mature, I'm going to grow out of this. Well, good preaching, Pastor Phil. Let me give you one more, then I'll just stop. Come on, Pastor Austin. I think the main reason that Peter tells us that we should hang in there, and the Bible tells us that we should hang in there, is because Jesus did not quit. And because he didn't quit, he saved you and me. You understand that it's only by Jesus persevering through everything that he went through in his life that enabled him not to quit. And there, there, there was a lot of times Jesus could have quit. I, I love Max Locato in his book, the, Wor- the Love Worth Giving. He says, Jesus could have quit the moment he looked at his tiny, small hands. Wait a minute. I hold the earth in my hands. The waters are... And Jesus comes as a baby... And he sees those little bitty hands. He could have quit. Jesus could have quit the moment he got the first whiff of that stinky diaper. <laughs> Who's doing that? Mary says, oh, Jesus, you messed in your britches again. Who, me, the king of kings, the Lord of lords? 
I'm out of here. Are you with me? Jesus could have quit the first time he felt cold air. Because in heaven, everything's perfect temperature. You do understand that. If there's no other reason at all for some of you to get excited about heaven, then no heaven's going to be perfect temperature. No cold, no hot, no humidity. The moment Jesus felt the cold air in Bethlehem and Jew and, and Jerusalem, Jesus could have said, wait a minute, I'm going to get back home. How about Jesus could have quit the first time Joseph handed him some chores and said, Jesus, hey, you're part of the family, son. You've got to grow up. You've got to take responsibility. Here's your chore. What do you mean i got to clean the donkey stall? What do you, what do you mean i got to? He could have quit, but he didn't. On and on again, you could read through the Bible. What about the times when he's trying to get through the knucklehead disciples that he had? I mean, he's trying to get their best. He's doing his best to get these guys to get that the kingdom is not going to be up on the earth. It's going to be. And these guys keep missing it. He could have said, what? The? I'm out of here and just quit and walk. But he didn't. What about when Jesus, as a child, sits in the temple and he opens up the Torah, his Torah, his Torah, and he starts reading the Torah, and everybody starts nodding their head, going to sleep. Don't you imagine he could have thrown that Torah down and said, What are you doing? This is life. But he didn't quit. What about when he's hanging on the cross? What about when he's taking every stripe and every beating of that whelp? The cat of nine tails. What about when he's hanging there and the weight? Of the sin of this world. Hey, listen, at any moment, Jesus could have called 10,000 angels and said, Guys, get me off of this cross. But you wouldn't understand why he didn't quit. He didn't quit. Why? Because he loved us. 1 Corinthians 13 love endures all things, love perseveres through all things. Jesus didn't quit because he loved us. And I tell you this morning that some of us don't feel lovable and sometimes there's things in our life that we know, hey, I'm running, but I've got sidetracked and I'm out of the way and I'm not in the narrow way, I'm in the broad way. And sometimes we say, what's the use? Yeah, I, sh I shouldn't even try. And God reaches out just like I told you last week about Joash. Even when we fail, even when we mess up, what does he do? He pursues us. Why? Why does he pursue us? Because he loves us. Aren't you glad for that? So let me just wrap this thing up with action points. It's in your notes. What's my action points, Pastor, to finish wrong? Number one, ask God to ease your difficulties. Listen, that, that doesn't mean that you deny or you ignore the process that God has got you in. But time and time again, the Bible tells us that God's going to be close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in the Spirit. Psalms 34 and 18. Psalms 62 and 8 says, trust in Him at all times. Prepare, pour out your hearts to Him, for God's your refuge. Can I tell you this morning, it's okay to say, God, I, I don't know how much more I can take. Can you give me some relief here today? Come on, you with me? It's okay to do that. that. That's not trying to jump off of the potter's wheel. That's just saying, hey, God, I'm being crushed right now. Number two, be willing to see, receive help from others. Again, stop isolating yourself. Christianity is not a solo sport. It's a team effort. If you feel isolated, chances are it's because you are isolated. Don't isolate yourself. Find, you don't need a bunch of friends, but you need a few people. You need to come along beside them. You need to be giving them encouragement, and you need to be receiving encouragement from them. Get in a small group. Get in a ministry serving group at Heartland. Find some people in your life that can help you along this path. Number three, refuse to be bitter. Again, one of the things that I see more than ever anything, even pastors and lay people, is that when life isn't fair, when circumstances doesn't seem to meet up to our expectation, you know what happens? We get bitter instead of getting better. Job 11 and 13 says, yet if you devote your heart to him and stretch out your hands to him, if you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, can I tell you, bitterness will always lead you to sin. If you allow your life to get bitter because of something or somebody, it will always lead you to sin. He said, if you will put away the sin that is in your heart, allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then flee free of a fault. 
You will lift up your face. You will stand firm without fear. You will surely forget your trouble, recalling it only as the water goes by. You know what you, God will allow you to do in the process of running this race when you get hurt and you get disappointed? When you just refuse, that's one of the things that Sister Ron and I have made a covenant in our lives. In 44 years of marriage, we just refuse to get bitter at each, each other. I've disappointed her so many times. I've let her down so many times. I've, I've made promises that I couldn't fulfill. But you know what? 44 years, she said, I refuse to get bitter. Now, sometimes it helps her to burn my cornbread. That helps a little bit. She doesn't put poison in it, you know, but it just kind of helps her to kind of smile a little bit. When I put the cornbread in my, in my plate and it's been burned on both sides, I said, oh, I must have really messed up this week. But we just refuse to get better. My kids have disappointed me over the years, but I just refuse to get bitter. I've had friends that disappoint me. I just, why? Bitter, well, bitterness will always lead you to destruction. Number four, remember what's important in your life. Most of you understand that. It's not the things. It's not the stuff. It's always about relationships. And then lastly, number five, focus on Christ. It always comes back to Jesus. He's the author. He's the finisher of our faith when we focus upon him. Hebrews 4 talked about, Hebrews chapter 12 talked about that we got this great cloud of witnesses that's surrounding us. He said, what do, we, what do we need to do? We need to put our focus upon Jesus Christ. Can, can I tell you, and we've we got to quit. we just got a few minutes. Can I tell you this morning that there's been people that sit in churches like ours, there's people that used to be faithfully running the race that was fervently, passionately following Jesus Christ. But they got derailed. They got pushed aside. Little things nudged them off the path. They grew weary. They end up quitting. I want this church, and I want you, whether you've been running a long time or you're just some of you are just getting in the race. I want you to know that God's going to give you the ability and the strength to finish strong for you. Your gifts and your talents and your your the, the, the things that God has deposited in your life are going to be used for the furtherance of the kingdom. And you've got to trust God in doing that, okay? Trust Him in doing that.